everyone. I'm so glad that you are joining us for our watch party for the documentary From Farms to Incubators. Um, I'm so excited that Amy Wu is sharing this documentary with our audience because it really highlights a lot of what we've been talking about lately when it comes to the intersection between agriculture and technology, especially in the context of equity because Amy highlights minority women entrepreneurs, a group that has been traditionally un underrepresented in both agriculture and in tech. Um, we're super lucky because after the documentary, we'll get to have a Q&A session with both Amy Wu, who is the creator of the film, and Martha Montoya, one of the women highlighted in the documentary. Um, so Amy is an award-winning writer for the women's ag and ag tech movement. She is the creator and chief content director of Farms to Incubators, which is an ongoing project um, and it's won awards. It's the documentary has been screened at South by Southwest. And she's also the author of the best-selling book from Farms to Incubators, Women Revolutionizing How Our Food is Grown that was released in May. Amy was named on Worth's Magazine's groundbreaking 2020 list of 50 women changing the world. And she was named by Food Tank as one of 27 inspiring women reshaping the food system. Before starting from farms to incubators, she spent over, a de over two decades as an investigative reporter. Um, she has a bachelor's degree in history from New York University and a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University. And Martha Montoya has almost three decades of experience in worldwide IT, telecommunications, food and agricultural supply chains. She's worked with both small and large scale stakeholders, um, suppliers, government entities, and buyers. Um, she's been appointed to the board of the California Department of Food and Agriculture, and she served on the Worldwide Advisory Board of Women for Walmart, um, Executive Board of the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and several additional boards. Um, and Martha and her brothers, Gustavo and Oscar, have also won the Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence Microsoft Award for Ag Tools. So we are so thankful um, to have you join us and to view this fantastic documentary. Um, and now I'm gonna pass it on to Amy who can introduce the documentary. Thank you. Uh, thanks Jessica and Libby for that really excellent introduction for introducing both Martha and I, and it's a real um, honor to be here at this watch party uh, this evening, or maybe it's afternoon for you, depending upon where you are in the world. I understand we have people joining us from other countries, so we've got all different time zones here. And really, uh, a special thank you to the Organic Trade Organization for putting this together. Um, so my uh, introduction here to the film is going to be rather brief but I did want to give some context to the film and I'm going to work my way backwards by saying it is the fifth anniversary of the film, by the way. It actually was released um, first in February of uh, 2017 and first shown at the Western Growers Center for Innovation and Technology in downtown Salinas at a real, at a real live, I guess, watch party. <laughs> there were about 80 people um, in a room with, uh, you know, with beverages and wine, and we had a lot of the community and also the uh, stakeholders in agribusness at that that um, first screening. And the film, uh, and I don't want to give too much away, introduces uh, several women innovators and in, founders in this growing field called agri-food tech. Um, they are uh, mostly women of color, and I made it uh, more than five years ago under a grant from the International Center for Journalists. I am a professional journalist and storyteller by background, and I have a passion for telling the stories of women in food and farming and ag tech. So um, the inspiration for doing this is because five years ago or six years ago, nobody heard about women in ag tech. Actually, ag tech was a bit of a mystery too, you know, and when I, when people heard the word ag tech, they were like, what is that? And to this day, actually, there's still a lot of questions surrounding that, but a lot more understanding of what, of what ag tech is. 
So um, the film, like I said, uh, you know, really has brought to life um, not only uh, introducing people to the innovations in the field, but also the people creating the innovations in the field and also amplifying the voices of women, which is the purpose of having this documentary. In the first place, it is screened at over uh, well over 200 uh, places, including South by Southwest. And this is the first watch party, though, it is actually screened at. So thank you very much. And I, I hope that everybody will have lots of questions for both Martha and I, and we'll have an engaging discussion after the screening. I always wanted to have a farm because uh, food is very cultural for me. I'm Filipino. I'm a first generation American and I always wanted, that was the way I knew how to express my love. We need major scaling companies, companies that have a product in market, they've got financing, they're growing and scaling and our top 50 here was really around identifying those companies in partnership with our corporate partners. I still became a grower for a family farm. I was the only grower that was a woman. They hired me because I could speak Spanish, but my whole team was mostly uh, 40 to 50 year old men. <laughs> and so earlier on, I had a hard time trying to get them to, to do the work that they needed. So I was a grower who had to designate tasks, and if they had a question, they would actually ask my superior, who was a man, instead of me, and then I would have to redirect. My supervisor could not speak Spanish. Uh, there's a massive shortage of labor. As Mike said earlier, people are not you know, coming into the industry. The average age is getting older. Uh, and we're not seeing um, uh, new people coming in. And then as in, a, as in the tech space, I generally have to uh, I have to talk second. I can't talk first. That's just something that I've picked up. It still happens and I just accept it and move forward. And I am very, uh, as a woman, I'm much more cautious about what I say and how I say it and ensuring it's more uh, neutral. And We will uh, do our accelerator, accelerator launch in, in April. Uh, we run the Tri uh, Accelerator Program demo day. So we think that most of the companies we invest in are going to grow steadily and happily. I'm delighted to see Trace Genomics who won our event last year in the audience and it was a great experience for them. So you should see and talk to, uh, to the folks in terms of how to The story started more than five years ago when Diane and I met in graduate school. Both of us were very passionate about making an impact on the way in which uh, we can arm community members with, uh, with a way to stay one step ahead of disease, right? So what we've done is we've uh, built a really simple soil test for growers and farmers to be able to look at the biology of their soil. We all know that the soil biology plays a huge role in yield and crop health, uh, soil health and sustainability. So when we say soil biology, we mean the billions of living organisms that are present in every teaspoon of soil. Some of them are harmful to the plants. Some of them are beneficial, so they're good for the plants. The reason why we delved into ag tech was because you know we're very close to Salinas, we're very close to um, the vegetable bowl. We quickly recognized the growers telling us um, that they need a way in which they can measure soil health, soil disease. It was impossible to miss out on that opportunity. My grandfather was a farmer, but a very small scale farmer where he had his own farm that he fed his family with. And so we're definitely entering into a slightly different world um, than what we've been used to. And so what we do is we, we listen uh, very carefully to, to folks who know what they're talking about and mentors who've been able to guide us along some of the, the tricky challenges. Yeah, we have been in AgTech now for over two years and at least twice a week, three times a week, you know, we're out in the fields in Salinas. Um, and so that feedback loop, like, you know, where we're 
we are technologists at heart. Um, our team, we have an amazing team to help accomplish that. Um, but we also make sure that you know we're getting in that feedback from uh, directly from our customer base, the growers who are in desperate need of the. Um, and bringing that back to our team. So we are making the products, uh, making our technology fit the needs of the growers. In Salinas, I culture is very traditional and so even though they do these processes that are very lengthy it's because they're used to it and so even though it takes longer they know it's right because they've been doing it for so long. In general farming um, still uses paper to track things um, and the reason for that is because some of their processes um, timekeeping especially is pretty complex um, and even more complex in this area because the crop is rotating two or three times a year. So our company, um, we do equipment tracking, um, timekeeping, and field scouting right now. It's a mobile app. We don't have any extra hardware. That's another thing that makes us unique. So all the data collection is just through your smartphone. <laughs> I was studying computer science and then I did work in ag and I wanted to stay in the area. Everyone that I graduated with has had to leave the Salinas Valley to find a job and I was lucky enough to find one here. But what makes us unique is um, knowing the ag side and knowing their processes and I guess having some connections with the growers already. My parents are immigrants and they, uh, they were field workers when they came to the U.S. I've always kind of been around it. My dad started his own produce company. Uh, when I was younger and so just kind of growing up around it. Having connection with our customers, with our growers and with the valley, we don't want to come in and show them this is what you need to do. We're also learning with them so a lot of it was a learning process. Would you change anything That's right now as it is? Yeah, but like, like the would same you rather structure have... is just like opposite. You know? Yeah, mm -hmm. so the same flow, like yeah. one, two, three, yeah. and then... Trying to implement that software and telling them we can give them something that works that's better. They've also had other companies come in and say that, but a lot of times it's been companies from Silicon Valley or areas that aren't huge on ag, so they come in from a different perspective. And so what makes us unique is um, knowing the ag side and knowing their processes, <laughs> and I guess having some connections with the growers already. Yeah, once we start messing with it, for sure, we'll have more feedback. Yeah. We'll break it. <laughs> you guys will make it better. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. And growers speak to growers and say, this is working, and um, we grow from there. Only after I spent days, uh, you know, shadowing a grower, that I realized this is really, really hard work. And I had a very different kind of appreciation of, you know, the, the food or the produce I buy now. Ag shifts in agriculture technology. They want to solve some very real problems which are facing the small and medium commercial farms. We just moved out from a smaller office and we are in the process of getting a bigger office, which is the reason why we are doing the shoot uh, at my home. We have built a platform or a system which helps growers make much better decisions on their farm. So if you look at an organic farm of any profile, typically you'll find that they're growing uh, more than 10 or 15 crops at a time. So what the system does is puts a lot of data and technology to work and helps growers understand your true cost of growing one pound of carrot is $4 per pound versus the cost of growing something else is this much. It helps them make many different decisions which before something like Ag Shift was just based on intuition. And we will then take all that data and automate the, the compliance reporting for them. Especially organic farm, but even local farms, you're usually dealing with 20 or 30 different kinds of reports which you have to do. It's very time consuming. A similar analogy would be uh, TurboTax. I think we are at a right point where we can put a lot of these innovations to work, you know, to make small farms more sustainable and hence help, uh, you know, what we are really trying to accomplish as a society uh, when we say we have to feed 
10 billion people by 2040. I came here from Vietnam as a refugee. Growing up in Vietnam, I've seen the war and witnessing the cost of malnutrition um, in children and in women, I decided I would look for a solution, a more like a food-based solution for the problem of vitamin A deficiency, which is quite prevalent in Vietnam. Vitamin A deficiency a disorder is just easy to, to solve, but it's still so prevalent. Vitamin A deficiency compromise the immunity system. Um, it's very important in normal growth of children, but also for eye health. In, in Vietnam and, and, and other places where vitamin A uh, deficiency disorders is quite um, prevalent, you can see a lot of women when they get older and they have night blindness called xerophthalmia, and that's irreversible. So I decided that um, Northern Vietnam would be the study area. And when I went back there, I realized that meat and fish were quite expensive. And that's the, that is the natural source of vitamin A. And I identified it among the fruit and vegetable that people have. Red melon, the fruit to me that stand out, that's the red melon. And when I was little in Saigon, I know that my mother usually, at that time, she would get the fruit and dye the, the rice with it, make it red, red rice. And the color of it is so strikingly made red. And that's the color of beta carotene. So beta carotene actually is the precursor of vitamin A. I just have the hunt and this is, the, the food was really rich in carotenoids. The source of lycopene in this country is tomatoes. And the source of beta carotene on the Western diet is carrot. Red melon contains 70 times more lycopene than tomatoes, and 10 times more beta carotene than carrot. I came up with a way so that the farmers can then use whatever they have to make the oil and then keep that oil in their household. Most of the growers in Vietnam are actually women. So my goal is to give back to the, the growers in Vietnam by providing the market um, for the products from Red Melon so that they can continue um, growing it. I intend to use a percentage of the proceeds, uh, the revenues um, of, of Red Melon oil um, to um, help the growers of Vietnam. Also, I think um, investors would not want to take risk in an idea. And to implement this idea, um, you do need um, capital. I, at the beginning, basically, I feel like I work alone a lot. And um, so my goal is still to be able to find team members and colleagues and um, a network of people that are in a similar um, field. A lot of women in technology. So if you look at the ratios, many of them drop out. So first three or four months, I was just meeting farms. That in itself has been um, quite challenging, you know, because they're not kind of not as prepared for someone of my profile to show up to the farm. The fact that, uh, you know, you're a minority or you are this, uh, you know, this person who I am, um, Asian American. There were people who had this question mark on, you know, what am I doing there? Or why do they have to deal with me, right? Uh, me being who I am. So, you know, there are times when it, it, uh, it kind of takes a while for, for me to build that relationship with, with growers. When it comes to something very important for a, a venture at, at a stage like ours, uh, which is fundraising, honestly, it has been uh, more difficult than it has been with my previous ventures. It's, it's challenging. Uh, um, more so in Vietnam also, believe it or not. Still very old culture where um, 
women are not supposed to run your company? With my previous ventures, uh, I was owning the technology. I wasn't the one responsible to raise funds, right? So that's one part of it. Whether it's finding the engineering talent or whether it's finding the investment money, uh, I think it's a combination. I don't know which one is bigger or smaller, but the fact that I'm Asian American, I'm minority, I'm a woman, and then I, I have this, uh, uh, you know, this intention of doing something in ag. When you add all that together, it becomes a very difficult problem. It's getting there, but it's not at a point where you'd see many more women entrepreneurs really trying to solve challenges in agriculture until we, we fix some of these things. Go and you meet with either farmers or health officers, I mean, doctors and scientists. Um, usually, there's, there's no other women around. So, so one time I showed up at, um, I was um, taken to meet with the officers um, of the township that were supposed to do the study. And so, um, so I walked into the meeting room and there may be about a dozen or so of um, all different officers and doctors and um, And then I saw that at the end um, of the room on the top, there's a TV that playing um, a Playboy movie. And there's the whole time and everybody was just watching the movie. And they were expect me to translate it for them because that the movie is in English. And it's a pornographic. So I, finally I say, unless we turn off the TV, then I would leave. <laughs> I've been in computer science and technology for uh, almost my entire education. And so uh, being in a male-dominated environment is something that I, I guess you kind of grow used to. And, and obviously, you know, you notice, uh, you know, you you get noticed, um, and you, there are, I mean, there are events that happen um, being a female in a male-dominated uh, field and industry. Uh, I mean, I, I I was experiencing it up in the Bay Area, so they're not. Even though companies try to uh, try to make it better, it's not very welcoming. You know, even programming isn't a very um, very welcoming for women. I guess it's more like like negative. <laughs> but um, um, I just always felt like you know people were you know questioning whether I could do something. I guess. Um, but here it's like everyone's really welcoming. I I, I feel more accepted, and um, it's been a lot more fun working working in the area. Uh, you know, you always find a way to um, to work with folks who are supportive. And, uh, and who really believe in the same uh, problems and in solving the same problems that you do. And so that's really always been our uh, focus is, you know, work first, technology first, and, uh, and everything else, you know, kind of, you find a way to, uh, to blaze a trail through the rest. Yeah, I, I think it's more and more that women to be in the field, in, in, in the ag tech field and successful, and the more we, um, we gain our credibility and perhaps some respect. I see now there's a lot of um, women in, in engineering, in science, and so that trend will change now. We're, we're minorities in many different ways. We're young, we're women, we're also you know, ethnically mi minorities. And so um, I think maybe you just get used to being a minority and you stop thinking about it after a while. Um, you know, it's, everyone's uh, an outsider in their own way, I think. Um, and you can often find yourself in a new environment. And so I think once you're able to not focus on that and focus on um, the successes and the, and the things you have going for you um, and, and the things that you really, need, the message that you want to get out there, um, then the conversation becomes a lot easier and people are, are actually often um, very, very much willing to listen to us. It's still very unrepresented, but we are a newer company where we still, I guess, hope to change that. 
um, and we're starting a movement even here in this Western Grower um, building. They they hope to bring that movement in as well and shift the, shift the focus in that women can also do this job and there's a lot of opportunity for men and women in this area. It has to start early on. It has to start young. Like I have a, my daughter is 10 year old and she's already sold into agriculture. She's extremely fascinated. You know, I took her to certain farms. She has been seeing what I want to do. She asks me, what is it that you're doing? And when I share that with her, she has this spark in her eye that, wow, you know, uh, it's that complex. I didn't know that's how you grew strawberries. That's how early it has to start, that basic education. Uh, if we really want to get, you know, the, the younger generation or the next set of people and kids to understand about agriculture, they should be spending some time on a farm. And then they will have appreciation for it, which is inbuilt in them. And then you have the right talent. Once the spark is there, they will find most innovative ways to solve things. We have always done that. Uh, you know, I'm already training my daughter, exposing her to the good and the bad of agriculture. If we start doing that, that would be enough to have enough young women entrepreneurs to start changing this uh, challenges we have in agriculture. Underrepresented minorities will look at a job description and they will not apply unless they feel like they fit 100% of all the requirements. So we explicitly say in our hiring process, hey, if you think you even meet 50% of these qualifications, you should apply. You, we're reaching out to you because we think you'd be a good candidate. Our company is currently a majority women. Um, it is majority people of color as well. And those are demographic uh, numbers that not a lot of technology startups inside or outside of ag have. And it's something that we work very actively to recruit. When you have a diverse group of people, decision making is more robust and you get better decision making and better outcomes, better creativity, because you have different perspectives. Studies from groups like Catalyst showing that often return on investment is higher for an investor in a company that has a higher level of diversity. There have always been women in agriculture, but kind of behind the scenes, uh, more in terms of bookkeeping and running the family business. What you see now are more and more women up front becoming the actual entrepreneurs themselves. We're certainly seeing more resumes um, come in from women. And part of this is also knowing how to, how to communicate what you need at the company. The less specific you make it, um, in terms of like the nitty gritty details of what exactly you want this person to have, like the skill set, you know, the more you open it up and allow for a little flexibility, you'll be surprised at the types of people who will apply to those job postings that are a little bit, you know, allow for a little bit more flexibility. We need microbiologists, we need pest specialists, we need crop science, soil science um, experts. But if you're looking into nutrition, um, sales, marketing, product development, we need that too. Um, if engineering is something you're looking at, we clearly need automation. It's hard for me to imagine a discipline of study that would, would not be utilized by the ag industry. A trace especially, I think our goal would be to, to bring in and to maintain a diversity of opinions and perspectives and voices and backgrounds because that is really key to solving an interdisciplinary problem. If you are a VC and you are not investing in women, I don't know what you're doing. You know, given that the numbers are that immigrant run businesses, women run businesses tend to do better. Like the data is there, so it's, it's actually a business opportunity. It's not like a charity case. In America, less than 1% of the population actually farms anymore, right? And that less than 1% is actually an average age of 62 to 65. So I'm actually a third generation farmer here in Yolo County. My family did about 4,000 acres of grain haze and custom harvesting and orchard crops and livestock. So we have a, a very um, 
I would say honestly precarious situation where we have an aging population of farmers and not very many people who are doing it. The estimate is 50% of farmland is going to change hands in the next 10 years. We're not talking about dating apps, we're talking about food. Like we're talking about raising food for our communities and if we don't build that talent pipeline, um, we're kind of all screwed. So what's interesting is that there is such an, um, a growth and development in this sector right now that um, I'm seeing more and more women that are interested in the field. Um, it's important that the field be diversified and that women be at the table for, for a whole variety of reasons. Women don't get treated well unless there's, there are enough, there's a critical mass. When I was the program director for Ag Start, I saw a lot of up and coming ag tech companies that were headed by women, which, uh, which really, um, really made my heart smile. And I never doubted them. As a woman in farming in general, um, I never doubted that it, was, that it was possible and that it was coming. That the perception could be from me um, that because I'm no longer in that uh, network, in you know that I have to be before I feel like I'm alone out there. And now the more and more I see other people like me, and they're successful, um, and and that give me the confidence, and that also maybe project it out to other people who interact with me. Demographically speaking, if you look at the next generation, the next generation is in itself more diverse. Uh, our country is getting more diverse as the next generation grows up and takes on uh, leadership roles. So I want, I want women to be able to earn a, a good living as well and for them to be able to earn, um, to, to have their own businesses and to deploy technology means that they're going to be able to earn a good living. Wow, that was such an amazing documentary. The stories are so powerful. And for, I'm sure every woman on this, um, in this call, really relatable too. That's the thing that I kept. I was like, wow, I feel like they are talking about things that I have experienced. And of course my story is different, but the themes are very similar. So I'm so glad that you shared this. I'm so glad this was, made um, and we're going to go ahead and open it up to Q and A's. Um, we've already got a lot of questions rolling in from participants. We've had questions emailed to us um, beforehand, but I'm going to start with just a really basic question for Amy, um, just to get us started, especially for those of you who are new to this scene. So Amy, what exactly is Far, from farms to incubators. You know, we all watched the documentary, but I've also mentioned the book you authored and it's this ongoing project. So how would you define it? I would define it as a, a community actually that uses, it elevates and connects women in ag tech and has done it um, several ways. I mean, there is obviously the book and the film that have uh, been vehicles for presenting the stories um, to uh, sparking discussion, to asking questions, um, you know, certainly under told and, un un under -told and untold stories previously. 
But what it's become over the years and what it's morphed into really has become a hub where women in the field of agri-food tech can also connect with one another for friendship, for business, to collaborate and so forth. And over the, the hundreds of screenings that I've done, usually I will have one or two special women with me <laughs> who are women as well. And I like to spotlight their work and their stories. And often what's happened is the the, the uh, women and the guests will look at each other and say, I would really like to connect with the other woman. I dis discovered this over the years and said that I really see my role as being uh, using stories to, to uh, amplify uh, untold stories and also to connect uh, the women, but also to connect growers and investors um, and also agribusiness um, you know, CEOs with, with women as well. We need more women at the table. I strongly feel, I strongly feel that. So that's the big objective. And then the last objective I would say is that the stories uh, inspire young people, especially younger women to consider opportunities in a growing field of agri-food tech. Um, I think to some extent, um, uh, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math, which to a lot of extent falls into skills that go into ag tech is not yet associated with, with farming. You know, there's this light bulb moment like, oh, STEM equals farming? Yeah, STEM can also equal farming and agriculture. So I've been speaking to a lot of high schools, uh, universities, and younger people about that. And there's this like, aha, a wow moment. Like, really, there's opportunities. So, yeah. Yeah, and not only has STEM not been associated with farming, it's also not associated with women. I mean, you know, throughout my time in the sciences, the one thing that I hear from women that I mentor over and over again is, oh, I'd love to do science, but I'm just not good at math. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, that's kind of the mantra is that women feel comfortable saying, I'm not good at math. Um, which can't be right. <laughs> I used to think that myself, about myself, you know, until I was in my 20s, honestly. And all of a sudden I switched oh, wow. over to science and was like, oh wait, I can do math. And also, men I'll just mention this briefly. I'll just mention this, Jessica, briefly as well. So actually uh, from Farms to Incubators now is collaborating with other women uh, who have a similar passion and mission to do this. And we are um, creating tools to further um, connect women in ag tech. So there's a new directory and I can talk more about this, but there's a, a searchable Airtable directory of now 600, we have 650 women on there that actually all of them contributed their own names and contacts. Um, and it has been increasingly shared out more and more. We're hoping for people to ask for the embed code, please. <laughs> and that is another example of women working together and also kind of keeping the torch, uh, takes a community to keep the torch lit. Yeah, and I have looked at this list. It is amazing that you have so many women who have put in their information. And honestly, what was most impactful for me is being like, oh, wow, there are ton of women who are getting into this field. Um, just looking at the list is pretty powerful. Martha, I'm, I'm interested to hear your perspective, you know, your origin stories, I guess I should say, um, for what got you into ag tech and how you've experienced a lot of these themes that we've been talking about. I'll, I'll talk about the global perspective because I travel the world developing crops for many conglomerates around the world, um, mainly from the southern hemisphere of the world to the northern hemisphere of the world. And the common denominator across all farms, it was that the mother or the wife really managed the financials on the back of the farm. Um, it could be a teeny little farm in Vietnam or it was a large operation in, in, in Ecuador. The wife and the mother was always in the back managing the checkbook, okay? The salaries, the payrolls, the insurance, all the administrative side of it, right? So then move forward and I'm here in the United States. I was brought here by one large conglomerate to do a program in 2010. And I have always seen the USA with all these guys, right? The guys driving the tractor in charge of the farm and all that. And little did I know, because again, I was coming from overseas, from doing all these programs. I lived here, but I was traveling so much. I started uh, gravitating around the who made the decisions 
in the back on the off, uh, of the farm. And he was never the guy, the gentleman. I mean, if, we, if I had to deal with somebody, it was the, the daughter, the wife, the mother, et cetera. So I'm like, wow, this is interesting. So we did a survey, I would say a year and a half ago when there was this um, um, kind of um, groups of uh, gentlemen that get together to talk about farms. And the question was, if you're going to buy a tractor or you're going to buy anything for the farm, who makes the decision? And 60 year old guys, 70 year old guys will say, my wife, my mother, my sister, my whatever. So we have had the power but we have not had, and I come from a mother who had all the power, but he ne she never wanted to make my father feel bad. So he, she quote unquote, allowed him to think he was the decision maker, but she was really the one who drove the whole companies around. So I think that has to do with the, the, the way we have been raised around the world that we just don't want to step on the gentleman's toes kind of thing, <laughs> that we have stepped on the back, but. But, but I can tell you many women, many women in the farms know what to do, literally. Uh, but they just will not do it so much in front of the gentleman or the farmer. So just a little perspective, because I saw it overseas and when I came to the United States, and I'm talking North Dakota, I'm talking uh, um, Arkansas, I'm talking California, I'm talking Colorado. We did a survey and I didn't ask. It was a gentleman asking gentlemen. And quietly, they didn't know we were asking that purposely. And they, that was the answer. So um, that was good. That was good to know. So we have a good ground to work to bring women into this whole act deck. Now that we see that, that, that there's a potential there. And so many of the team members that work with me or with us come from rural USA. And they, they, the family is still harvesting or the mother is still packing. But the girl... And or the boy has gone to computer science or some technical background, and then they have come to work with us. And our job is to make their environment very um, friendly so they can grow, groom, we can groom them, they can stay in their communities, and then they can um, blossom for not them, but everybody else in the family. Okay. Yeah, that's fantastic. And as you were talking, I was not, I kept nodding. So I was like, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I feel like you defined it really well. <laughs> yeah. So, so I come from coffee farms. My, my grandparents, uh, my great grandparents and grandparents are coffee farms. So I grew up in the coffee farm world and um, um, a part of the business, the time and the other part in, uh, in uh, my parents' own schools and universities for working families. So that's another interesting combination. There's some misleading misunderstanding that uh, farmers do not want to get into the high tech or they are very tough to get into the high tech and that kind of thinking. And we women have, if we can educate our kids, we can educate, we have the patience to manage our household. Believe me, farming is easy, easy, easy to do. <laughs> they just have to give us a little space to do it. But, but persistence and tolerance is something we, we are raised with. And, um, and uh, so we will be able to survive and, and thrive on this uh, whole industry of ag tech. But there's no choice. We have to get, not only women, in general, the whole world has to get into ag tech um, to, to come up with the difference of numbers of not coming enough workers, uh, more people to feed, less food to waste. So there's no choice. So might as well jump ourselves as women and lead the, lead the pack. Martha couldn't have said it any better. I agree. <laughs> the other thing that interesting, it's interesting to me, Jessica and Amy, is that when I started working with the largest buyers in the world, they were all gentlemen, right? And the buyers, the, the people who make the decision of the contracts and the buying. But yet, every, the, all the ones shopping were women. So I was like, that's interesting. I, I remember thinking, I was young at that point, 24, 25, and I'm like, that's interesting. Why am I dealing with Mr. 40 year old guy? And he supposedly knows what we women want to shop on the grocery. Kind of like the guy, the gentleman who designed cars. 
but they don't know we have a purse and we need to put the purse somewhere in somewhere. I mean, like, can, some, can a woman design a car that knows where I can put my purse, right? So same thing is like, how did they do that? So I think that um, that's another interesting thing. We're starting to see more merchandising women, chief merchandising officers, because they know what we want. <laughs> they are women. They know what we're walking, which product we grab fast to get going. But it was always interesting to me to see that the decision making of these billions of dollars were in the hands of God, gentlemen, instead of women who knew what we prepare, how do we prepare and how we shop. That was the other interesting part of it. So that's the other switch that is starting to happen. And you see the retailers starting to name more presidents or chief merchandising officers, rightfully so. But on the other hand, if I can jump in here, there's still a big challenge when it comes to women founded companies or women co-founded companies even getting funding. Funding is still the major, uh, you know, I, I in the research that I've done and, and also talking to uh, many, many different women from internationally, um, yeah, it, the challenge is getting funding and also getting women to sit, you know, women who are sitting on the board having actual board of director seats at the big agribusiness companies. And that is a case that's, a, it's an interesting challenge my projects normally would be in the middle of a jungle, literally in a jungle. And I would go to a banker in Beverly Hills and I said, it's a $25 million project. No big deal. Here's the check. Go do it. How is it that you can invest overseas in a very unstable country, yet you don't invest in a woman who's here across the street from you? It's mind-boggling and still mind-boggling. And then if you look into the numbers of minorities, even worse. I mean, women, women, and then women minorities, and so on and so forth. So eventually you have to give up. But that, that is a challenge. Uh, my last project was in Pakistan uh, for a mango program. And I remember vividly how we got the money, like in a week or two, in Pakistan for mangoes. And, and that was my last project before I jumped into this whole technology. And I remember sitting there, and I'm in record on Senate, going to Senate to say, I don't understand this. Why is it that we are not funded as much uh, as overseas projects? Um, and so that's your aim. You're so right. Where do we move? Where do we help move the needle? And the unfortunate part is that I see many of the funds um, are tied to a lot of deliverables. Today I heard for the first time one fund saying Act Heck is trying to be more patient with funding. Uh, this is not selling creams. This is not selling social media things. This is this is cycles, right? It takes time to, to build this type of interest in industry. So hopefully inv investors will understand the longer term. And yes, you get more money longer but you don't make it so fast. Yeah. The way that um, uh, on the on similar lines, the way that from farms to incubators and uh, myself has seen this, the how to address this is also starting young, meaning uh, building ag tech into the curriculum and entrepreneurship and all the key words along with that, women leadership and so forth at K to 12 level. I mean, now some of the community colleges, colleges and universities are catching on quickly. I think like for there's, uh, you know, a whole initiative now with uh, the ag tech e equals workforce at in California with some of the community colleges. I think there are some trade organizations that are involved with that as well. But I feel very strongly that the way to do it is to build it in even earlier, you know, and to keep that going um, all through college and universities. And there's a lot of opportunity to, to do that in the curriculum. So uh, I feel like hashtag start them young <laughs> is, 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 uh, is something that I really wanna highlight too, yeah. Yeah, and you're preemptively answering some questions that are coming in. So one is ideas for bringing on the next generation. Um, and I feel like you just talked about that and it's so critical. And you know, another thing Martha um, that you were mentioning is how it's, been difficult for women to break into ag tech and even more so for women of color. And one of the questions that we have is where are all the black women in ag tech and farming? That is, 
that that is one of the very sad stories I have to say because when I came to this country and please forgive me I come from a country where um, we did have this whole discrimination going on but it was more hiding than in the United States uh, and only until an act of Congress of the United States pushed our country of origin Colombia to move forward the Afro Colombians into the front line so but it took an act of Congress in USA to move Colombia that's that tells you how far we go. Um, but the unfortunate part is that we had so many amazing women in farming on the African-American communities that when they got all their lands, they, because of the lack of um, funding, because of the lack of support, they abandoned farms. And we lost that amazing generation that caused a lot of social issues. Now there's some movement, thank God, in Washington with the, uh, the Black uh, Farmers Initiative, where um, there is, uh, Mr. Biden has pushed and brought in uh, several key people to his, um, to his uh, uh, USDA team to start pushing and, and supporting this. In California, there's, uh, our secretary is pushing a lot, has pushed and, so, and funded the organizations. But it's going to take, <laughs> it's going to take, uh, think about it, if you're a parent, an African-American mother, and your daughter says, I want to go into farming, just think for one minute. And the thinking is like, why would you do that? Mm. It's a tough industry. It's not an easy industry. Oh, but I'm going to go in that tech. Oh, so maybe it's that like um, Amy saying, it's, it's this shifting of the brain to show that it's not going and working on the ground only for the ground because there's a... There's a connection of working on the ground with, with a lot of the past that happened in this country versus, no, this is now an asset. And I'll tell you one very important story that is kind of related. Everybody knows Mr. Cesar Chavez. And Mr. Cesar Chavez had a whole movement about how to treat workers. Mr. Cesar Chavez, for the record, had the ability to buy land in Central Valley to be able to own the land so the workers could work the land. And he chose not to, and it's in the books. Uh, he chose not to because he said, I don't want to become a landlord, we're workers. All that land was acquired by a lot of the white guys in Central Valley. And we lost the opportunity at that point of owning the land in the Hispanic community. And that's known, and whatever, I, I'm not to judge, that's what happened, that's history. My point is that as long as we don't own the land, it's much harder to, to farm. And so, and now it's a little bit challenging to own land because of the cost of land, but not Actec. Actec is a different story. You can get in less with less expense to get into an industry that it's, you can go globally in, in seconds with your, with your thinking process. Like we just saw on the, um, on the documentary, soil analysis of soils anywhere in the world. You don't have to own the land. Uh, analysis of food safety anywhere in the world. So I think that ACTEC is going to shortcut for us women and women minority that. So hopefully we get more of, of that. But if the, per, the person who's asking, there's the, uh, um, the black, it's called the Black uh, Farmers of America in DC. There's a whole initiative about women in that arena. And yeah, just to piggyback on, on, on what uh, Martha was saying is that in most of the uh, stories and the women that I've encountered, um, I would say the majority did not come from a background in agriculture. There's only a handful that actually came from generations of farmers, you know, we have. Uh, so the, the, the key message, and I'm actually evidence of that too, <laughs> is that I didn't come from a background in, uh, in farming either, but traditionally that is how it has happened, you know, that, is passed down to the man and the, the boy in the family and so forth. If you go to the Salinas Valley in California and talk to the big farms there, that is what they'll tell you. A lot of them still family own, but that is changing even within the, the big farms in the fields that the younger women in their 30s, you know, early 40s, even 20s are coming back and running it also. But the exciting thing about ag tech is it extends the skills of like traditional agriculture. So it's not just in the field. I keep saying it's not just tractors and overalls, not because I don't like tractors and overalls. I think that's great. You know, we need more women mechanics also in the fields and running the farms, but 
It includes, um, you know, artificial intelligence, blockchain sensors, uh, drones analysis of the soil, you know, the data is critical too. So there's actually a whole new set of skills and it allows uh, people who traditionally have not been in these fields to actually really thrive also. So it's at the beginning stages, I, I think so. And I've been seeing a couple comments come in from Isabel Brumley. Um, Isabel, if you want, you can take yourself off mute and make some comments. Thank you. Um, I'm just very excited for this um, presentation. It's awesome. I love it. I am the outreach uh, person for USDA, and my goal is to recruit minorities, Hispanics, any minority, Blacks, Vietnamese, and um, we really are trying to undo what happened to Black people. I am a Black woman, and um, I'm very adamant and passionate about reaching out to underserved. We have special programs for underserved people, and we encourage anybody to get into agriculture, but of course, especially minorities. But we are in a crisis, like you mentioned, we cannot get enough people in a, we need to grow food. We need to feed people and we have less resources and more people to feed. So yeah, we're desperate and we got jobs available. We got high tech, good paying jobs. So we do offer um, a full ride to universities uh, to pay for anybody that wants to study agriculture, IT and, and biology and all these sciences. We offer a full ride. We'll pay the full ride, broom, board, and, it, and all that. So yeah, and I can put the information on the chat. And I think I will. <laughs> and that's an important, important point that you bring up because the reality is that um, there's so much work to be done fast. And I don't know, uh, I mean, we have to speed up and thank you for bringing it up. Um, I just wrote a document to the Minority Outreach Office that applying for grants is such a complex issue at any level of the government. And so can you make it much simpler, <laughs> please? Can you make it like, give me the opportunity to get that 50 first $50,000 to prove it, but don't make it so complex that I have to have so many so, professors and all that. Yes. So we get that a lot. Wrong. Yeah, so we get it a lot. So what we do is we have universities with extension departments. Their job is to help people get these grants. We do workshops. We put them in contact with the person that can answer all the questions. It's, it's really, well, I shouldn't say it's not that complicated because it can be complicated for some people, but it's a matter of what is it that you're looking for and, and cross your T's and, yeah, and dot your I's. But um, we do have training workshops. We do that a lot. And anybody that wants information, please, I put my email in the chat. I'm more than happy to do that. This is our job. We do outreach and we try to help people come on board and get this money. That's Thank great. You. And please do put your email in the chat. I think you'll be getting sure. some emails from us. And for those of you who are interested in talking about equity in ag tech, and thinking about you know the historical structures of racism and how that's impacted who not only who is developing ag tech but who is able to benefit from ag tech come to our conference on february 10th um amy is actually one of our speakers for that conference and we're going to be doing a deep dive into it um we have some pretty incredible speakers you know in addition to amy we've got um karen washington some, just some fantastic people. So check it out. I put the link in the um, chat. I also wanted right. to add, add one more thing briefly, uh, Jessica, as I'm thinking about this, is that uh, I recently came back from a road trip to California. It was part of the book tour, but I call it a road trip. But anyway, I purposely went to uh, the colleges, some colleges and universities in the Central Valley in, in California, in cities that some people might call gritty. But anyway, you know, uh, I went to, for example, Cal State Stanislaus in Turlock. So a lot of the students there who attend the schools there, their parents and grandparents work in agric agriculture. Agriculture is huge. I mean, this the almond industry is tremendous there. So um, 
you know, a lot of them work in the fields and so forth. So their their conception, the conception, the, 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 the idea is that agriculture don't go into it, you know, because you're going to be working in the field. So when I talk to talk to them, you know, the, the again, the light bulb moment of opportunities in ag tech um, came about, but also they mentioned a real need for wanting mentors and wanting to hear from people who, uh, you know, who previously maybe were not in agriculture, but launched, you know, an ag tech company or are now in it and how they did that. So I think there's a real need for also mentorship when it comes to this, this area as well. And all of the people that, um, I've come across the women founders, co-founders and so forth have all, most of them have told me they would actually really like to speak or be uh, you know, a mentor. I realize mentor is a tremendous word, but actually a lot of it means just uh, sharing you know, their stories as well. So I'll, I'll put that out there that I can't, um, I can't stress enough the importance of mentorship also. Yeah, and that kind of brings me to my next question because mentorship might be part of the answer, but this is for both you, you know, Amy and Martha, um, for Amy, why are you so passionate about telling the stories of women innovators in ag tech? And then for Martha, why are you interested in telling your story? You know, it, you're taking time out of your super busy day to be here telling your story. Why? I mean, I can, I can start with that. I mean, uh, I'm a storyteller and I have always been um, really drawn, I guess, or passionate is another word to telling the undertold, untold story. Um, without getting into the nitty gritty, I've also written about garment workers in Chinatown and done a lot of investigative work as a business reporter as well. So I am also a history major and I feel strongly about documenting the voices and capturing a moment in history. So I think it was a bit of serendipity that I was sent to the Salinas Valley in 2015, actually, because I'm an avid consumer of food, but I had not seen the, I had not had the emotional connection to actually see the people who actually plant the seeds and grow them and so forth. So it sucks, it sticks in my memory, but I think, you know, like everybody eats, right? I mean, we all have to eat. <laughs> Some of us love to eat. And uh, the, the bottom line is that by 2050, the world population is estimated to be 10 billion, right? So uh, it's critical, you know, the producers. And yet I always felt like the stories of the people behind the scenes were not really being told as people. It, you know, it's important to have the data, the information, the numbers, but also to have the connection with who is growing your food, who is packing it, I think is really critical. It personalizes it as well to the consumer. So my own... Um, so my, my own uh, passion is, of course, the telling stories, portraits. So I, I feel like my goal has now become to tell every, the story of every single woman in agri-food tech. So all 650 women plus internationally to get the stories out there to inspire and to connect and so forth. I myself, I think, um, uh, experience a bit of people asking me, you know, how come somebody who didn't grow up in agriculture is so passionate about writing about agriculture? Well, I think I shared a bit of that is that uh, we're all involved in the food systems in some way. You are purchasing the food, you're making the decisions. Women are playing a tremendous role in the household, buying the food, making the food. Internationally, I think, uh, you know, it's tremendous the amount of women that are involved every continent. So I was actually surprised that not more women are at the head of the table in decision-making roles when it comes to actually food and farming. It actually surprised me to this day. I don't, I cannot name a, a lot of women who are leading big agribusiness companies still and sitting on the board. So I strongly feel that there needs to be a diversity of perspective and opinion, not, not the numbers to say, oh, this is, we have this amount of women now, you know, just put them there. But truly, you know, the diversity of perspectives in their stories are important. So that's what, that's what draws me to continue the work that uh, I do. My case is a little bit different. Um, I was raised by a mother that had, um, it was called social enterprise. Now I look back and it was a social enterprise educating uh, working families in Colombia for people who couldn't afford to be educated and for them to take on, uh, my mom to take on 1,500 students on one, 7,500 students on the other place. I mean, she was 
the innovators. She will come up with a school program for breakfast. She will come up with a curriculum for kids that never sat down. I mean, she was always innovator and creative. And that's why uh, you see cartoons and creativity from my side. It comes from my mother that was very creative. I'm a teacher by profession. So a teacher like my father used to say, you're born or you're not born a teacher. You're it within yourself, right? It's like being a priest or being a nurse. You're you're in society, you, you're born with it and you're in to help the world. So I went to this, my father, by the way, just a little story. I was the one who used to go to the school, took care of the stamping the books, uh, took care of the, the ringing the bell. I mean, I was involved in the whole school with since I was a little girl, all the way until I was 17, 18. And I remember the conversation when I said to my dad, so I'm going to go and study and then I can become the principal. And he said, no, the principal is going to be your brother <laughs> who never will come to the school. Who never? He was out there doing whatever. That's to tell you that, that we have a, still that also to fight that even our own fathers are not supportive. They love us, they care for us, but uh, giving you the responsibility, your brother. So I was the one who knew it. And I see it still today. 100% I see it today. The gentleman, the farmer will let her do it reluctantly, but eventually he had to let it go because he, had, he can manage everything, right? And so, uh, and then eventually give it up, which is the biggest one. Is it help being help is one thing. Letting somebody run the whole thing, it's a different story. And so long story short is when I landed in the United States, and I had to find a job. Uh, one of my first jobs was uh, sourcing um, in, up and down the Americas for Australian New Zealand uh, products. And it was processed food. Mm. And hey, processed food is processed food. Pure banana, frozen beans, frozen broccoli, and asparagus. And again, it was a job. But on my fifth year or so, I looked into, wow, this is what we pack. This is what we eat. This is what we mixed. This is what we kill. And I remember going through a whole year of, whoa, I don't know if I could keep doing this. Because if I'm not eating it, why am I doing it? To feed other people, right? I mean, this is like scary. <laughs> like, if you don't open that can of asparagus and you don't eat it yourself, why are you selling it to the world or producing it for the world? And that's when I started saying, wait, 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 let me go back to the roots. Where does everybody start in nature? So let's go back to nature. And that's how I went from that whole process world to the farming world back again, which I was raised. But again, as a kid, you forget things. And then you, and that's when I always tell people, you always go back to your roots, no matter what, thank God. <laughs> so back to the roots. And then the second wake up call was when I was, looking at what we put on the soil <laughs> to make the fruits grow big or stay longer or last whatever, right? Or, or put them in this uh, uh, unit so they, we can put them whatever we need to put them so they can last 30 days. I'm like, whoa, we have another second issue. It's not only the process, now it's even our own farming products. And that's when I started saying, you know what? We need to get some kind of tool. And that's why I choose exist to is to make sure that we have more farmers and more buyers understanding how to buy locally source local because if you buy local you don't have to put as many elements on that ground to feed your communities around now is it going to happen tomorrow no, it's going to take a while but i remember when organic started 10 years ago i mean always been there but 2010 i remember a lot of the big farmers saying hmm Organic is not going to happen. And guess what? It is happening. So um, again, it's, it's been a, a, a path of being so much inside of the industry, the guts of it, taking the plants from permits from UC Davis and taking them, transporting them to another country with all the permits and watching what we needed to do in order to not produce in another country with all the chemicals behind it, right? So it's been a, a, a journey to say, how do we feed more people, but we feed them the right way, not just for the sake of it. And then the third and the last one is that the whole world was created around, ag was created around the grain business, the wheat and the rice and the corn in the world. And so 
um, even the financial systems, if you think about it, the whole financial system is around that industry. And really, we need to eat more fruits and vegetables <laughs> and nuts and herbs, right? And so that's why I took the, the route of the special crop. I said, if I could have taken the grain industry, but I don't believe, um, I don't believe in it because the reality is that we need healthier uh, foods in our systems. Um, and it's the fastest growing segment in the world, the specialty crops. So it's been a path of understanding through being inside the system, how the world is moving and how the new generations are saying, look, vegetarian, uh, veg vegan and all that. And so imagine that now with that trend, more young people will feel more comfortable coming to this industry. So I'm taking my time here because I know that if, if I show my journey of these not very nice places I have been, to tell you we opened the road for you to come in now and change the world with, with now now we, 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 we open the road for you and you can come and keep changing the world with your technology thinking, with your thinking like the ladies with the soil. Um, so we can have a better better system. So when I'm 100 years old, I'm going to be fed very well. Yeah, I love that. Even my even my angel investors, my investors are women, by the way. Um, um, they're all women. Uh, Seventy percent of them are women, and I have a couple of funds, but uh, they're women who believe. I never met them before, and they believed on me, believed on the on the social cause about helping farmers, number one. And number two, that, hey, it's a woman, she's going to do good. That's their thinking, really. Even my one of my investors who, as soon as she started investing, and uh, she has a, a chronic illness, and I said, why are you eating organic? And she said, nobody ever told me. And I said, why don't you try? And she's now completely organic and completely vegan, and her health has improved. And mm. so she says that her investment has paid off <laughs> already. <laughs> so just in general, that there's a whole motivation to change the world and, and help us all, uh, like say me, I'm opening the road for the next generation to come behind us. Yeah. And we are getting towards the end of our time. So I wanted to, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask you both, you know, a what's next question. So... Amy, what's next for farm from farms to incubators? Martha, where do you see your path taking you in the future? Well, from farms to incubators uh, is an ongoing project, and actually, ongoing is means that it's actually expanding and growing. Some of it, I will have to say, stay tuned <laughs> for. But um, in the meantime, super excited to um, do a second um, talk tour. Uh, in um, in uh, California, back to some of the universities, for example, uh, in Stockton, finish off, you know, Fresno. We also have I also have a women in ag tech uh, art and uh, art and painting exhibit that will be in at Fresno County Library on April 16th. We have some female farmers, uh, including dairy farmers, who actively use innovation, who also paint as well will be sharing um, that will that uh, stay tuned for that information and also the directory has picked up steam we recently updated all of the information and have had quite a lot of feedback about 90 percent of the women on there have actually emailed us directly and said they would like to find ways to make a difference and asked what can i do to help um, also the mentorship aspect of it um, I am eager to hear from folks out there who are interested in being in being mentors or speaking to some of the younger uh, folks who are interested in this. I actually have a little bit of a background in higher education as well. I taught undergrads overseas um, in Hong Kong, storytelling and journalism for three years. So I, I really enjoy working with youth and um, you know seeing a difference made in their lives as well. Um, so that's that's a few of the uh, what's next um, and happening. And also, please check out the website. Um, we recently redesigned it, and there's a huge link up there that says resources. And we, I love to hear from folks who want to collaborate and also work together. 
for ourselves and for myself, and I say ourselves because now I have a whole team of young girl, ladies and, and men who are a minority. All of them are minority, by the way. Um, I need to make sure that I ensure that they're uh, taking care uh, financially. Uh, so whether it's fundraising and or whether it's customer acquisition, that is my focus, full focus on it. And thank God we have good customers that understand that social impact, which is important. And I always tell the social impact that you're not only hiring a company who benefits you, but you're hiring a company who's benefiting community, a community which is the minority. So that's my number one job. My second job is make sure that we have, um, we, um, pro we take more data to the farmers, the fastest, the the faster, the better, because the reality is that we're losing a lot of the farm uh, farming um, stake into from United States, in United States from other countries. The data is not lying. Every year we lose more and more farming and farmers in United States because we're getting a lot of overseas um, farm products um, that are much less expensive or less regulated, uh, and and so therefore. We, we need to be self-sufficient. So I'm hoping that we fast track this so we don't lose such much, as many farmers uh, as fast as we're doing right now in the United States. Um, we need to keep our own food. We need to grow our own food. Yes. You know, I want to make a comment about that. Unfortunately, I understand that a lot of people from China are buying farmland and a lot of farmers are selling it because like in some cases they're offering like twice the value and farmers are so desperate they're giving it away and that is dangerous if we lose all our land yep and and by the way central america has i saw this 15 years ago when a whole delegation of taiwan landed in nicaragua and bought a ton of land well it's happened all between central all america and all over so unfortunately we, we we need to act fast here so yes i hear you yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, and before I go to wrap up, Amy, how can people get involved? Uh, people can get involved by, first of all, um, reaching out to me by screening. Uh, if you're interested in actually holding screenings, for example, at your organization or if you work at a school, uh, would really love to extend that further um, and also include um, the uh, some talks. You know, like I said, I'm really excited about um, highlighting uh, the stories of, um, you know, women like Martha has uh, has joined me numerous times. And there's also a lot of other uh, women innovators um, You can also get involved by if you're a storyteller as well. I know that there are folks out there who love to write and actually tell stories and documents. So there's a long list out here <laughs> and I'm looking for somebody folks to join me on telling the stories further. That's great. And yeah, I will echo people reach out to Amy and do a watch party like this. It's so fun. We've been getting so many comments about how awesome it is. So thank you both for joining us. Thanks everyone who was here to watch, to ask questions. Um, and we are going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, so um, I want to make sure to invite everyone to our two upcoming events along this same vein. So I mentioned that on February 10th, we're going to have a conference about equity and inclusion in ag tech. And like I mentioned, Amy's going to be speaking at that event. So come hear more about how minority women fit in with organic ag tech. And then on February 24th through 26th, we're holding an organic focused hackathon, Hack at Organic, in collaboration with the Gathering for Open Ag Tech, um, acronym GOAT. Uh, we're gonna be teaming hackers with farmers, industry members, basically anyone who wants to join to develop solutions to current organic agronomic challenges. Um, both events are free. So we hope to see you there. So thanks everyone. And thanks for staying with us so late and have a great evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, it was awesome.